Hello, everybody. A warm welcome from all of us here at Arigant Academy. I am Meena Miss, and I'm from the biology section. And we are here to revise two topics. Topics which are as different as chalk and cheese. Look at this. We have the structure of chromosomes, cell cycle, and cell division. This chapter is an intriguing one because it gives us the answer of our very existence as to why we exist and how we are. The next chapter is photosynthesis. It is an essential process which gives us the food we eat and the air we breathe. So two top topics absolutely different, but very important syllabus wise. So without wasting much time, let us start with the first chapter, structure of chromosomes, cell cycle and cell division. Now, this is a revision lecture. So what we would be doing is highlighting the structure and the concept of chromosomes. We would be discussing the structure of DNA. We would just briefly skim over cell cycle and discuss the four mitotic phases of cell division. Now, the major question that arises in our mind is how important is the chapter? So after the cancellations and all, every chapter which is present becomes important. And uh, roughly, as my experience says, uh, this chapter carries around five to six marks. Uh, one of the most important topics that usually comes here are the various phases of mitosis. It comes in section B, where you see a diagram and questions related to it are asked. And you need to know the phase preceding it and the phase consequent to it. So let's start uh, with the chapter. We'll be revising uh, some basic concepts which usually raise doubts in your minds. Now, one of the major questions that arises in our mind is that if a person is injured or wounded, what happens to the cells in the injured tissue? So as uh, our dear Shizuka very sweetly says that obviously the cells there die and they lose their ability to carry out cell division. So the next question which pops up is, if the cells have died, how in earth does an injury heal? How do our wounds heal? So the question here is simple, that the dead cells are replaced by new cells. And those new cells have an energy, a vigor to carry out cell division. And this cell division brings about complete recovery, complete healing of the wound. Cell division, from this, my dear friends, we get to know is one of the most important properties of cells and living organisms. It is due to this property that a new organism is formed from an existing one by either sexual reproduction or asexual reproduction. It is also the property responsible for our growth and it helps to restore, replenish and to recover an emaciated, wounded body. Now, another question that arises is, if cell division is such an important phenomenon, which are the cell organelles which actively participate in cell division? So we're going to see a basic structure of the cell which highlights only the organelles which take part in cell division. This is the structure of the cell. Now, you can very clearly see an organelle which has been labeled as centrioles. Centrioles belong to a cell organelle by the name of centrosome, which is exclusive to the animal cell. The centrosome plays an important role in cell division. It duplicates and moves towards the poles of the cell. And the aster, that's the fibers around the centrioles, they form a spindle and the chromosomes attach to it and they get split during cell division. But that will come later. Let's first pay attention to the soul of the cell. The soul of the cell is none other than the nucleus. The nucleus has a nuclear membrane and it has a dense organelle by the name of nucleolus, as I very famously call it as nucleus ka bitwa, nucleus ka ladala, nucleolus. It is very rich in RNA. It produces ribosomes and plays a very important role in protein synthesis. Very importantly, I'm interested in a fine meshwork of fibers which are found inside the nucleus. And they are the chromatin. Look at the name, chroma. Chroma means color. So a fiber which has an affinity for color. If you look at a cell under a microscope, what you see is 
a cell with a darkly stained nucleus. So it is the chromatin fibers inside the nucleus which absorb the stain. Which stain, miss? It could be methylene blue. It could be crystal violet if it's an animal cell. If it's a plant cell, it could be eosin. You could be safranin. Words we have seen in the textbook. So what exactly does chromatin do during cell division? So when a cell is ready to divide, the centrioles duplicate and move towards the poles. And consequently, the chromatin fibers start condensing and become thick and short and form structures called as chromosomes. Chromo, color, zone, body, colored body. Chromosomes are the components of the nucleus, which are the carriers of hereditary characteristics. Every organism has a fixed number of chromosomes. We humans have got 46 chromosomes. Look at the diagram on the right. You can see all the 46 chromosomes of humans. But what is more amazing is that these 46 chromosomes appear as pairs. They're all present as pairs. So conversely, I can say that it has got 23 pairs. 46 chromosomes can be called as 23 pairs. For example, a tiger. A tiger has got 38 chromosomes. So I can say a tiger has got 19 pairs. Let's borrow a variable from algebra. And um, I'm not taking x, y, z. It's too boring. I'm taking the letter n. Let n be the number of the pair. So I could say that I have 2n number of chromosomes, 2 into 23, 46. Or a tiger also has 2n number of chromosomes, 2 into 19, which is 38. So we say that every living organism has got 2n number of chromosomes, where n is the number of the pair. And this 2n is called as diploid. Every organism has diploid number of chromosomes. Another amazing fact that you see in this diagram is that all the pairs are absolutely identical. The chromosome in each pair is identical to each other. Such identical pairs are called as homologous pair of chromosomes. Now, the first 22 pairs of homologous chromosomes are also called as autosomes because they are responsible for all our body characteristics like the color of my hair, the color of my skin, the color of my eyes, the long nose, and you have it. It is the 23rd pair which is different. It's called as an allosome or it can be called as a sex chromosome. This chromosome determines our gender. Females have got a homologous pair. It's called as XX. But the males have got a heterologous pair, yani different chromosomes by the name of XY. A highly magnified version of XY can be seen on the corner left hand side. And for your information, the Y chromosome is the smallest chromosome with the least number of genes. On the top left, you can see a magnified version of the chromosome. It is seen under the electron microscope in this way. Now the question is that in the karyotype, the chromosome appears as a dumbbell-shaped organelle. Whereas when you look under a microscope, it appears like an X-shaped organelle. Why is there a difference? Why is it that this appears dumbbell-shaped and this appears X-shaped? We'll come to that, but let us first digest the information that I just gave you. Hey, a brief recap. So every body cell, ha every body cell has same number of chromosomes. We have got 46. Two chromosomes identical are called as homologous pair of chromosomes. The first 22 pairs are autosomes. They determine our general body features. The 23rd pair known as the allosome determines the gender of the organism. Now we come to the main, main question as to why a chromosome appears like an X-shaped organelle. So I just told you that we have got 23 pairs of chromosomes. So every cell in my body has got 23 pairs. Now, when a parent cell divides into two daughter cells, 
it is very important that each daughter cell carries 23 pairs. So if I have 2N, both the daughter cells need to have 2N. Only then it belongs to the organism. Matlab, mere cell ke paas 46 chromosome hai, to agar mere skin ka cell divide ho raha hai, to dono cells ke paas 46 hone chahiye. But algebraically it's not possible. How would 46 divide into 46 and 46 again? So, the body has got a beautiful mechanism. Anil Kapoor ki tarah, 1, 2 ka 4. Yani, 2N becomes 4N. 46 becomes 92. Yes, the chromosome number becomes doubled. Now, how does the chromosome number become doubled? Simple. The homologous pair of chromosomes. See the picture on the right. The homologous pair of chromosomes produce a replica. They produce a china ka duplicate, which is known as the sister chromatid. The sister chromatid appears like this, like an egg shape. And it is connected at the center by an organelle called as the centromere. The upper small arm is the P arm. The longer short arm is the Q arm and connected in the center at the centromere. Now, when the cell divides, the sister chromatid split at the centromere and equal number of chromosomes pass to each daughter cells. So 92 is going to split 46, 46. Each cell gets the correct number of chromosome. Hence, you always see an X-shaped chromosome. Now comes the other question. What is a chromosome made up of? A chromosome is 60% made up of a protein called as histone. And 40% of it is a fiber by the name of DNA. Naam to suna hoga. It is deoxyribonucleic acid. It is the carrier of heredity. What is heredity? All the characteristics that you inherit from your parents. All that is thanks to your DNA. Look at this. It says that each chromosome is made up of DNA, which is tightly coiled around proteins called as histones to support the structures. And humans have got 46 chromosomes. Let us try to imagine. See, you haven't seen it. We need to imagine it. So we're going to see it in a diagram and try to visualize what I'm trying to say when I talk about histones. Look at this diagram. You need to see this diagram from the bottom. We are going to go in the ascending order. So you can see your duplicated chromosome and the centromeres are very clearly visible. If I were to take a tiny section of the chromosome and look at it under the electron microscope, I would see a highly condensed chromatin fiber. If I were to take a small section of the chromatin fiber, then I would be able to see balls of histone protein. Histone is a protein. So you can see the yellow colored balls. I am at the third diagram, okay? So I can see balls of histone protein and the DNA is tightly wound around it. Okay. Now, eight histone molecules, it's called as the histone optima. Eight histone molecules with DNA tightly wound around it to hold the structure of DNA is called as a nucleosome. Millions of nucleosomes are found in a chromosome. This diagram shows us three nucleosomes. You can see three loops. They are the octomer of histone with DNA wound around it. If I were to take just a single histone molecule with DNA and look at it under an electron microscope, I would be actually able to see the amino acids. All of us know 20 amino acids make a protein. So those colorful Z structures that you see, these are the amino acids of the histone. And you can see the DNA wound around it like a tire telephone wire. And if I were to take a small section of the DNA, voila! I see my DNA. This is the double helical structure that we usually study. Although it was discovered by Frederick Mischel, it was Watson and Crick who gave us the actual structure of DNA. It has got these lateral strands which are spirally wound around each other, giving it a very special shape which is called as the double helical shape or it's a simple double helix. It has this double helical shape because imagine an octomer 
and DNA bound around it, giving it that space. Again, an octomer, again, DNA bound around it, space. So this structure is due to the DNA and the histone together. The colorful rungs of ladder that you see in between are genes. Genes are the unit of heredity. They carry the hereditary characteristics from parents to offspring, and they are nothing but nitrogenous bases. Nitrogenous because they're proteinaceous in nature, bases because they're basic in nature. We have basically four nitrogenous bases, which are divided into two groups, purines and pyrimidines purines and pyrimidines. Which are the purines? The purines are adenine and guanine. AG, OG, LOG, SUNOG, adenine, guanine. And the pyrimidines are cytosine and thiamine. Cytosine and thiamine. CT bajaye. So AG and CT. The purines and the pyrimidines bond with each other with a very weak hydrogen bond to form a gene. Let's understand this better with this structure. Now, the lateral strands of the DNA is called as a phosphate backbone. It is made up of a phosphate molecule, which you can see as a yellow dot in the right side diagram. It is made up of ribose sugar, hence the name deoxyribose sugar. You can see that the ribose sugars are complementary. And that is the reason that it helical shape. Dikta hai. And in the middle, you can see the bonding of the nitrogenous bases, which is forming the gene. Now, there is only one combination for, of each to form a gene. It's always adenine with thiamine and cytosine with guanine. So it's always A, T, C, G. It can be TA, it can be GC, but no other way. So A, T, C, G, adenine, thiamine, cytosine, guanine. No other way for connection or formation of genes. And the miracle is that just two combinations and we have around 30,000 genes in the human body. This beautiful structure of DNA, the double helical structure, as well as the proper structure that you see on the board, is important syllabus-wise for labeling. One molecule of phosphate, one molecule of ribose sugar, and any one nitrogenous base are together called as the nucleotide. Several nucleotides combine it with each other to form genes. So a chromosome might have thousands of nucleosomes and millions of nucleotides. Lots and lots of DNA in a single chromosome. So the genes are made by the combination or there are a sequence of nucleotides connecting together with a hydrogen bond. So what are you going to take home? Kya yaad rakhna hai? Kaun se uh, definitions yaad rakhne hai? Kyunki hum revision kar rahe hai. Chromosomes, the colored bodies, carriers of hereditary characteristics. Chromatin, the fine meshwork which is found in the nucleus. Walter Fleming was the person who had first seen a pair of chromosomes in the cells of the salamander. Rosalind Franklin and Watson Creek, both of them discoverers of DNA. Histone, 60% of the chromosome protein molecules. Nitrogenous bases, AGOG, purines, CT badai, pyrimidines, ATCG is the combination. Nucleosomes, octamer of histone with DNA, nucleotide, one phosphate, one ribose, one nitrogenous base. Joining together to form a gene. What is it joining together? Weak hydrogen bond. Centrosomes, the structures which play an important role during cell division when the centrioles duplicate. Centromere is the organelle on the chromosome which holds the chromatids together. Gene is the unit of heredity. So this was a very quick take home that you're going to take from this chapter. We're moving to the next part of this chapter, which is the cell cycle. Now, to understand cell cycle, let us first understand the two types of cell division. The type of cell division that I was just speaking about, 1, 2, ka 4, wala, was mitosis. Mitosis is a type of cell division which occurs in your body for growth, for repair, for replacement, for regeneration, and it also takes place during asexual reproduction. They say amoeba hai. Amoeba divides into two. All those kinds of cell division are called as mitotic cell divisions or mitosis. Very important for our portion and syllabus.
They occur in somatic cells. What is soma? Soma is body. So these are for our body cells. So your skin cells replicate by mitosis. Your bone cells replicate by mitosis. Your blood cells replicate by mitosis. So this is simple. A cell has 2n number of chromosomes. It will double. 2n ka 4n. It will double. And then when the cell divides into 2, 4n divide by 2, 2n, 2n, original number is restored. So here the number double hota hai. The different kind of cell division is meiosis. Now, meiosis only occurs during sexual reproduction. Only during sexual reproduction. And it occurs in the germinal cells of the body. What do you mean by germinal cells? These are the cells which belong to your reproductive organs. In the males, the reproductive organ is the testis. And in the females, it is the ovary. The testis produces the male gamete sperm. The ovary produces the female gamete, which is the egg. Now, the sperm and the egg are the only cells in your body which have half the number of chromosomes. They do not have 46. They have 23 chromosomes. Point to be noted, Your Honor. Sperms and eggs are the only cells in your body which have half the number of chromosomes. They can be called as the male gamete and the female gamete. So, what happens is, if the cell was belonging to the testis, I would call it as the germinal cell. It would divide to produce two daughter cells with half the number of chromosomes. 23, 23. And these cells would be called as sperms. And similarly, if it were the ovary, the cells of the ovary would divide to produce half the number of chromosomes in the egg. 23, 23. Now when fertilization takes place, that is the sperm nucleus fertilizes the nucleus of the egg it will produce zygote zygote is the baby now the zygote has got 23 from mamma and 23 from papa proper 46 chromosomes it is also the reason why you have characteristics from both the side of your parents and that makes you a unique individual meiosis is also known as reduction division meiosis not so much in our portion, so we're not going to get into detail. We're going to begin straight away with mitosis. Important terms first. Two types of cell division, I got it. Mitosis, asexual, meiosis, sexual. Now, the cell division occurs in a series of events. And this series of events is called as a cell cycle. Okay? Now, the cell cycle consists of two phases. The non-dividing interface. And the dividing M phase or mitosis. It could be either M phase we bol sakte hai, hum unsko mitosis phase bolenge because that's how we are studying. Mitosis is divided into two phases again, karyokinesis and cytokinesis. Kinesis, division. Karyos, nucleus. Cyto, cytoplasm. So it is nucleic division and cytoplasmic division. The nucleus divides first with its own malpani and then the cytoplasm divides. The mitotic phases are also divided into four parts. Prophase, metaphase, anaphase and telophase. Very important for our syllabus. Let us first quickly get into the cell cycle and then move on to the four phases of mitosis. Look at this. This is the cell cycle. Now we first begin... At the interphase level, you can see that we have divided interphase into the G1 phase, S phase and G2 phase. The green colored part. Pehle vahaan par nazar fair lo. G1 stands for first growth phase, S stands for synthesis phase and G2 stands for the second growth phase. What happens during the first growth phase? You know, earlier, interphase used to be called as a resting phase because there was no actual uh, cell growth or division taking place, but it should not be called as a resting phase because during this time, there is a lot of internal changes taking place in the cell. Now, the first growth phase is for the daughter cells. Ek par mitosis ho gaya. So, daughter cells are formed. The daughter cells have got a large nucleus, but very less cytoplasm. So, during the first growth phase, the cytoplasmic material increases. So, the cell comes to its original size. Also, there is Division of mitochondria, because it's one of the most important organelles of the cell as it carries out respiration. You're right. And if it were a plant cell, there would have been replication of chloroplast. 
because for the plant it is one of the most important organelle for photosynthesis which is going to come now on so ye dono divide hote hain chloroplast and mitochondria yaad ye rakhna hai what happens in the g phase mitochondria and chloroplast replicate they divide they increase in number and the cytoplasm increase so the cell grows in size can you see that start button over there that start is a phase during which some of the cells permanently pass into the resting phase jaise neurons ho gaye jaise aapke heart ke cardiac cells ho gaye they are not meant to divide you're born with them and you have to live with them till the day of your death so they permanently pass into resting phase there are some cells which pass into the resting phase for a small period of time jaise bone cell ho gaya liver cell ho gaya koi 2 saal koi 5 saal koi 10 saal and there are some cells which pass into the resting phase for a very brief period of time or they immediately pass into the synthetic phase and that is the skin cell constantly dividing so when they pass into the synthesis phase it is during this time that the chromatids replicate sister chromatids are formed and at the same time the dna inside is also duplicating the dna is xeroxing so more and more dna material is being made during the synthesis phase so this is the time jab bantu ka four ho jata hai after that the cell passes into the second growth phase during this time more protein and rna and enzymes are made which are needed by the cell for mitosis after the cell has passed through the g1 s and g2 phase it is ready to enter into the mitotic phase that is karyokinesis karyokinesis may be we looking at prophase metaphase anaphase and telophase and then move into cytokinesis now we're going to start with mitosis the mitotic division beginning with the first phase prophase you need to remember that when the cell enters into prophase the chromosomes have already formed its duplicate yani the chromatids are ready attached at the central neurons okay yeah so let us have a look at the prophase during the prophase I'll, before i even start teaching i just need to give you a important tip that whenever you are practicing these phases i keep telling my children in the class is that when you need to draw it okay and whenever you draw keep saying the various changes that occur in the cell during this phase and draw it out so that way you do not miss out a phase you do not miss out a step aap steps bolte jao aur sath mein draw karte jao to aapki dono practice ek sath hoti hai these phases can be memorized only by proper drawing and you need to practice it because these diagrams will be coming in your exam for 5 marks the diagram is not a 5 marks it will be a part of the 5 mark question okay so during prophase the nuclear membrane starts disappearing because it's karyokinesis so the nuclear membrane starts disappearing the centrioles start moving towards the poles and the chromatin fiber start condensing into chromosomes and you can see that the sister chromatids have already been formed now the cell enters metaphase whatever started in the prophase completes in the metaphase jo wahan shuru hua yahan khatam hoga matlab nuclear membrane has disappeared the nucleolus has disappeared the centrioles have reached the poles and they form a spindle the chromosomes have completely got condensed and are visible under the microscope these chromosomes arrange themselves parallel to the equatorial plane to agar ye poles hai they are arranging themselves parallel to the equator the chromosomes attach themselves to the spindle at the centromere so you can see that the centromere is a very important organelle of the chromosome then we move on to anaphase during the anaphase what happens is that the centrioles give a pull to the spindle as a result of which the chromosomes which were attached at the centromere get pulled apart and they start getting pulled towards the poles they get split at the centromere and they get pulled apart towards the poles and you can even see a slight indentation in the cytoplasm that means the division is almost beginning when the chromosomes or the sister chromatids are getting pulled towards the pole they resemble a bunch of bananas final phase of mitosis where the karyokinesis is getting over is the telophase 
you can always recognize the telophase because the groove or the indentation is very clear. You can clearly see an indentation taking place. This is early te telophase. I'll show you the late telophase diagram also. So the chromosomes have already reached the poles and they start decondensing back into chromatin fiber. The nuclear membrane starts reappearing. The nucleolus starts reappearing and you see an indentation in the cell. So in other words, you can say that telophase is an exact opposite of prophase. जो वहां पे डिसअपियर हो रहा था वो यहाँ पे रीअपियर हो रहा है जो वहां पे कंडेंस हो रहा था वो यहाँ पे डिकंडेंस हो रहा है सो इट्स एन एग्जैक्ट ऑपोजिट सो द फॉर्मेशन ऑफ द टू न्यूक्लिया इज ऑलमोस्ट कंप्लीट इन द टीलोफेज वी कैन सी द लेट टीलोफेज इन दिस डायग्राम The first diagram that you see on the top is late telophase. You can see an actual indentation taking place, and you can see that the chromosomes have reached the poles. After the karyokinesis is over, we start with the cytokinesis. Cytokinesis is nothing but division of the cytoplasm, where the cytoplasm divides and two daughter cells are formed. During this, the nucleus is very clearly formed, and the entire chromatin has again decondensed back into thin fibers. and the cell division is complete from here it is going to again enter into the g1 phase of the interphase cycle if it were cytokinesis in a plant cell we all know that plant cells have a cell wall made up of cellulose so it is not possible for the indentation to take place so a cell plate is formed a cellulose cell plate is formed in the middle which helps in the division of the plant cell into two daughter cells so that is how you can recognize or identify whether the given diagram belongs to animal cell or plant cell and you will be asked to justify so you can justify because if it's a groove it's an animal cell if it's a cell plate it's a plant cell another important difference to identify an animal and plant cell is that an animal cell will always show the presence of a centrosome and a spindle fiber which is missing in the plant cell centrosome is an organelle which is not seen in a plant cell so you'll never see the spindle fibers there for the division of the chromatids that is your answer for justification okay now for sexual reproduction though we don't have meiosis we should understand that whenever offspring are produced by sexual reproduction there's so quite a lot of genetic variation you are like your parent you are not your parent that is because when the chromosomes the pink ones coming from the mama and the blue ones coming from the papa so when the homologous chromosomes come together there is invariably some crossing over of the chromosome when the chromosomes cross over there is some exchange of genetic material and this exchange brings about lot of genetic changes or variation in the offspring these type of chromatids in which the genetic crossover has taken a taken place are known as recombinant chromatids because there is some recombination here and this part where the crossing over takes place is called as the chiasma you should know what a chiasma is it is nothing but crossing over of chromosomes which leads to genetic variation with this we have completed the chapter the major highlights of the chapter which are important syllabus wise we are beginning with the next topic that we have which is photosynthesis photosynthesis is um, an important topic in plant physiology and believe it or not it holds a weightage of whopping 8 marks so a short short question in section b is going to come from experiment in fact all plant physiology chapters you need to be very thorough with the experiments and the reasons as to why certain steps are being carried out in the experiment photosynthesis ka equation one of the most important parts of this chapter every experiment that they give you they'll ask you to ex explain the process with the help of an equation so children you need to practice this equation written only then you will not forget the 6 and 12s now the major uh, substances which are necessary for photosynthesis are carbon dioxide and water carbon dioxide is going to enter the plant through the stomata the stomata opens during um, in the presence of sunlight due to the turgid gas cells it enters in and it gets reduced to glucose the water is of course coming into the leaves uh, through the xylem the ascent of sap which is coming up by the transpirational pull the water is used to reduce the carbon dioxide to glucose sun's energy that is sunlight is needed 
along with the green pigment chlorophyll, which traps the sun's energy, which helps to split water. It forms glucose and which again polymerizes to form sucrose and starch. We'll speak about it. With six molecules of water, which is reused back in the plant body, and six molecules of oxygen. Thank you, plants, for giving us oxygen. We are in dire need of it. The major organelle which takes part in photosynthesis is chloroplast. This is another important diagram of the chapter, which shall be coming for labeling, and questions related to it are a common um, you know, it's, it's a very common occurrence in the papers throughout the years. You will be seeing chloroplast coming uh, time and again. Now, chloroplast is a double membrane structure. It contains of these disc-like organelles, which are called as thylakoids. Thylakoids, uh, you know, they're always present as if they were a pile of coins. And these pile of thylakoids are known as the grana. Singular granum. One pile is granum. Many piles are called as grana, which are connected with the help of lamella. Now this granum has got a continuous lumen which is filled up with chlorophyll, the green colored pigment which is necessary for photosynthesis. All these grana are suspended in a matrix, a thick substance known as the stroma. Now the grana or the thylakoids is the site for the light reaction. The photochemical reaction takes place in the granum in these thylakoids. Whereas the dark reaction, that is the biosynthetic reaction, takes place in the stroma. So the traveling takes place. So the first the water enters into the granum and then the reduced NADP goes out in the stroma where the carbon dioxide is present. So water enters into the granum and the carbon dioxide is in the stroma. Let us look at chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is a green colored pigment. It is a proteinaceous pigment made up of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and a very important element, which is magnesium. And there are nine types of chlorophyll, which play an important role in photosynthesis, majorly chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. The picture on the right-hand side is, of course, the stomata. In the morning, the epidermal cells pass the water into the guard cells, making it turgid due to the potassium iron theory, and the carbon dioxide enters in, and of course, the necessary evil, which is transpiration, that helps the water to get pulled up for photosynthesis. And in the evening, in the absence of sunlight, the guard cells become flaccid, the stomata closes, and no more CO2 gains entry. Now, this is the cross section of a leaf. It shows the mesophyll layer. Mesophyll layer are the green cells of the leaf, which contain chloroplast and chlorophyll. The rectangular cells on the top part is called as the palisade layer. The palisade mesophyll carries out photosynthesis along with the circular cells in the middle, which are called as the spongy mesophyll. Both of them play an important role in photosynthesis. The purple colored structure, the circular structure in the diagram is the xylem. It gets the water. The water is going to enter inside the cells by the process of osmosis. Okay. And the carbon dioxide is going to enter through the open stoma by the process of diffusion. The carbon dioxide remains in the stroma of the chloroplast. The water will enter into the granum of the chloroplast. Now the raw material has reached the ultraviolet radiations, that is the sunlight containing photons, can directly penetrate into the cuticle of the leaf and the photons help to split the water molecule. Let us see that reaction. We have divided photosynthesis into two phases. The first phase is the light dependent phase, which is also called as the photochemical phase. Now, the first step that takes place is the ultraviolet radiations of the sun. The photons are absorbed by the chlorophyll present in the thylakoids. And these photons help in splitting up the water which is already present in the granum. It helps to split the unwilling donor water. See, water don't, doesn't want to get split, but it is an unwilling donor. However, the photons, which have got tremendous energy, help to split the water in order to extract its electrons. So, water gets split to give us four ions of hydrogen, four hydrogen ions, four electrons are released, and 
two atoms of oxygen. Two atoms of oxygen combine together to form an oxygen molecule, which is going to again get out of the leaf through the open stomata. Again, it will diffuse out. So oxygen is given out during the light dependent phase. This reaction is known as photolysis. Lysis means breakdown. Photo means light. Breakdown of water in the presence of light is called as photolysis. And where is it occurring? In the grana of the chloroplast. So now we have four products. Oxygen, electrons and hydrogen. Now let us see what is going to happen to all of them. Oxygen to hum summat chuke bhai. Ki oxygen mein two atoms of oxygen combining, releasing as an oxygen molecule and helping aerobic organisms like us to survive. What happens to the hydrogen ion? There is a coenzyme by the name of nicotine amide adenine dinucleotide phosphate. I know it's a big name. Listen to it once again. Nicotine amide adenine dinucleotide phosphate. It is a carrier coenzyme. This function hai ki usko hydrogen lekar bahar stroma me jana hai. It is a carrier. It is carrying this hydrogen so that it can add it to carbon dioxide to convert it into glucose. So this NADP is going to get reduced because hydrogen is getting added. And along with that, electron is getting gained. Reduction is gain of electrons. Reduction is addition of hydrogen. So in general, photosynthesis is a reduction reaction. So NADP gets reduced to NADPH with the help of hydrogen ion and electron. The question which arises is, Miss, what is NADPH? Is it nicotinamide, adenine, dinucleotide, phosphate, hydrogen? No. You simply call it as reduced form of nicotinamide, adenine, dinucleotide, phosphate. I am usko pyar se NADP bolti hu. So it is reduced form of NADP. What about the rest of the electrons? These electrons have to be uh, carried on to the other side because gain of electrons is reduction. And we also require energy to push the NADP out. That energy is uh, received with the help of the energy-rich compound, which is ATP, adenosine triphosphate. So what happens is, the ADP, that is adenosine diphosphate, combines with inorganic phosphate, all thanks to the electrons, which have been uh, released by photolysis. They get combined together to form ATP. This energy will help the NADP to push towards the stroma. And once it comes to the other side, the electrons will be released again, and they will be gained by the carbon dioxide to get reduced. Since it is a combination of the inorganic phosphate molecule to ADP, it is called as phosphorylation. But it is taking place in the presence of sunlight, so we call it as photophosphorylation. You have to remember the definitions of photosynthesis. You have to remember the definition of photolysis. You have to remember the definition of phosphorylation also. We're coming to the light independent phase or the biosynthetic phase. Where is dark phase kaha jata tha? Wrong. Wo dark phase nahi hai. It's not taking place at night. It takes place simultaneously. But it is not dependent on light and it is taking place in the stroma. So what is going to happen? The hydrogen ion of the NADPH will reduce the carbon dioxide to glucose along with the electrons which are released from ATP. And the glucose, which is finally formed due to photosynthesis, gets converted into starch for storage. Let's have a look at this one. This is a better diagram, which makes us understand better. You need to see the diagram from light-dependent reaction. Pay attention to the diagram. Let's try to understand it. The light-dependent reaction occurs in the thylakoids of the chloroplast. Sunlight helps to split water, photolysis, giving us hydrogen, oxygen, electron. Oxygen given out as O2. Hydrogen helps to reduce the NADP to NADPH along with the electrons. And the electrons also help to bring about the photophosphorylation of ADP plus phosphate to ATP. The ATP pushes the NADP out. Now come to the light independent. Up stroma ki taraf aja towards the right side. So you can see that the NADPH releases its hydrogen and reconverts back into NADP. 
and then it will go back to the thylakoid and again carry out another uh, a cycle of photosynthesis. So this hydrogen is going to reduce the CO2 to C6H12O6. At the same time, the ATP which push the NADP out again splits back into ADP, inorganic phosphate and electron. What does this electron do? This electron helps to reduce the carbon dioxide. Gain of electron plus gain of hydrogen is reduction. So glucose is formed. Now glucose is easily consumable. So the leaf has to convert it into starch. However, for conduction, it is converted into sucrose because starch is water insoluble. So this process in which glucose is converted into disaccharides or polysaccharides is called as polymerization. Now, we have completed the most important part of photosynthesis, which is um, the process of photosynthesis. Other than that, I told you that you need to be uh, revising all the experiments which are given in the chapter. You need to be speaking, uh, learning the various reasons as to why we destarch a plant, why do we dip it in alcohol, why do we put it in hot water. So those justify while our questions are going to come and do that well. And um, since we are at the end of the lecture, uh, it has been great uh, connecting with you. Thankful, uh, all of, uh, a big thank you from all of us at Arihant Academy. And uh, till we meet next time in the next video, it is uh, bye-bye from my side. Take care and namaste. See you soon.